Hi! In this lecture, we are going to look at a type of function called a polynomial. Already this semester, we have seen a couple of types of polynomials. The first, of course, are the linear equations, which form lines, and the quadratic equations that form parabolas. Lines are what we call a degree 1 polynomial, because the exponent on the function is 1. Quadratic equations are what we call degree 2 polynomials, because the highest exponent in those functions are 2. In this unit, we are going to be looking at higher degree polynomials. For instance, f of x is a degree 3 polynomial, which we call a cubic. In this case, it looks like this. g of x is a degree 4 polynomial, and it looks like this. A degree 5 polynomial might look like this. So you might have noticed that as the degree got higher, the functions became more wavy. That is, they kind of went up and down more. And in fact, the degree of a polynomial determines exactly how wavy it can be. A degree 2 polynomial um, just is going to have one big turn, and that's all that it can do. A degree 3 polynomial has the possibility of turning twice. Now, it might not turn twice, but it could. A degree 4 polynomial can turn three times, and so on. So you notice there's a pattern here. We can summarize what we just saw in this fact. If a polynomial has degree n, it may have at most n minus 1 turning points. That is, the degree of a polynomial will limit the amount of waviness that the polynomial has. Now, a degree 5 polynomial does not have to have 4 turning points, but it can have at most 4 turning points. That's what we can get from this fact. Also, if you're looking at a graph and it has 7 turning points, then you can be guaranteed that the degree of that polynomial is at least 8. This discussion on the turning points illustrates how we can analyze polynomials. What we're going to be doing a lot in this unit is analyzing these polynomials. So what does it mean to analyze something? Well, here is a definition to examine methodically by separating into parts and studying their interrelations. What that means is we're going to be taking polynomials and breaking them down in a way so that we can tell something about these polynomials. The point is to be able to look at the function and, and tell something about it. That is, we're going to analyze it by looking at the smaller pieces and telling how those things come together to form the larger graph. So why do we study polynomials? Well, First, they are a useful tool in modeling certain situations, and polynomials are actually a very nice type of function for lots of reasons in a mathematical sense, and so they're good to know. However, I think the most important reason that we study polynomials is that it gives us a good opportunity to develop analytical skills. What that means is, if we take a situation that's complicated, it's important to be able to break that situation down into smaller pieces that we can then think about and try and figure out so that we can understand or maybe help solve the, the problem that, that we have, the larger problem. It could be the U.S. economy and breaking it down into um, factors so that we can look and see what causes certain things to happen. Or it could be the defense on the opposing football team looking at how, um, you know, breaking down how they play and trying to figure out a way to, to, you know, get past them and score a touchdown. In any case, you take a complicated situation and you analyze it so that you can then understand it. Polynomials are sufficiently complicated to help us build these analytical skills.
So what exactly is a polynomial? Well, technically what a polynomial is, is any function that can be written in the form, and you can see it here on the screen, where the coefficients a sub n, a sub n minus 1, a sub n minus 2, etc., are real numbers, and the values of the exponents are integers, starting with n and then counting down all the way to a possible constant term. So which of the following are polynomials? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it and see which ones you think are polynomials and which ones you think are not polynomials, and why. In this case, the first function, f of x is equal to 5x to the ninth power, etc., is a polynomial. Um, all of the coefficients are real numbers, and more importantly, the exponents here are integers. So we have, this would be a degree 9 polynomial. The second function is not a polynomial. The reason for that is that the last term includes 2 to the 2 times x to the negative first. In this case, x to the negative first is not allowed. Now, there's nothing wrong with this function. It's just not what we call a polynomial. This next function, f of x is equal to 7, is a polynomial. In fact, it's a linear polynomial. If you remember, f of x is equal to 7 is a horizontal line. In this case, all of the coefficients, a1, a2, and so on, were 0. And the only number that's there is the constant term. The next function is also not a polynomial. The reason is, is that the exponents are fractions that can't be reduced to whole numbers. And finally, this last equation is a polynomial. Even though it has different types of numbers for the coefficients, these are all real numbers, and all the exponents are whole numbers. Now, <clears throat> Here are a few important definitions that we're going to be using throughout this unit. First, whichever term has the highest degree, that is, whichever term has the highest exponent, we call the leading term. The coefficient in front of that is called the leading coefficient. The last number, if there is a number that does not have a variable, we call that the constant term. This is always the y-intercept. So in this case, the leading term is 3x to the fifth power. The leading coefficient would be 3, and the constant term would be negative 1. The leading term is very important because it always determines the overall shape of the polynomial. It's what we like to call the end behavior. In order to explore the end behavior, we're going to look at some of the basic power functions. That is, x to a power with nothing else after that. The first, of course, is just a linear equation. f of x is equal to x. That would be our degree 1 polynomial. The next is x squared. We're familiar with that. x cubed has this interesting look. x to the fourth power looks like this. You might notice that it kind of looks like x squared. x to the fifth power looks like this. Now you might somewhat recognize this as well. It looks a lot like x cubed. And x to the sixth power looks like this. If you notice, there's a lot of similarities between the even-powered functions and the odd-powered functions. That is, x squared and x to the fourth power and x to the sixth power look a lot alike, and so do x cubed and x fifth and x to the seventh, etc. We're going to look at just the even-degreed functions and see how they relate. So first we have x squared, which we'll, we're familiar with, intersects 
the origin at 0, 0. x to the fourth power looks a lot like x squared, except for it's a lot steeper. That is, as we get out past 1, the numbers increase at a much higher pace. x to the sixth power is even steeper than x to the fourth. x to the eighth power is even steeper, and x to the tenth power is steeper yet. However, the overall shape is still the same. That is, any even degreed function is going to have the basic shape of a parabola. It just might be a little more intense. Now we're going to zoom in on the area right around the origin to see how these even degreed functions behave there. So here we have x squared, and as we can see, it intersects the origin. It also goes through the point 1, 1 and negative 1, 1. It has those points. If we look at x to the fourth power, it also intersects at the origin and goes through the point 1, 1 and negative 1, 1, except that in between 0 and 1, it's a lot flatter. And then, of course, after 1, it gets a lot steeper. x to the 6th power is going to do the same thing. It's flatter still than x to the 4th and x squared, and it goes through these three points, just like the other two, three, two functions. x to the 8th power does the same thing, and x to the 10th power is even flatter, and then it gets very steep as it goes through 1. Looking at the odd degreed power functions, we see first f of x is equal to x. This one is unique in some way, but it does share something in common with the other odd degreed functions. That is, it starts in the third quadrant and it ends in the first quadrant. That is, it starts low and it ends high. Looking at x cubed, it looks like this. Also starts low and ends high x to the fifth power has that same basic shape, it's just steeper. x to the seventh power is steeper yet, and finally x to the ninth power is even steeper. If we continued this on, x to the eleventh power would be even steeper, and x to the thirteenth would be steeper, etc. Zooming in at the origin, we see that here it crosses through 0, 0. It also goes through the point 1, 1 and negative 1, 1. If we look at x cubed, notice that it also will go through these three points, 0, 0, 1, 1, and negative 1, 1. Except, of course, it flattens out here around 0, 0. If we look at x to the fifth, it's even more flat than x cubed was, but it still travels through these three points as before x to the seventh power is flatter yet around zero, but then it gets much steeper as we get to one and negative one. And finally, x to the ninth power looks like this. It, it gets even flatter um, near the origin, and then it gets even steeper as we get through one. This pattern would continue. If you were to look at x to the eleventh power, or x to the thirteenth, or x to the twenty-seventh power, it would have the same basic shape as the others, except that it would be more flat in the middle, and it would be steeper once you got through 1. Now, if we have a leading coefficient that's negative, it takes these same basic shapes and flips it across the x-axis. This is one of the transformations that we talked about, a reflection across the x-axis. So x to the fourth power, which looks kind of like x squared, if you took the negative x to the fourth power, it would look like this. f of x is equal to negative x to the seventh power is going to look like x to the seventh power, but flipped. In this case, notice that it starts in quadrant two in the positives, and it ends in quadrant four, which is the negatives. So the leading term can tell us a lot about the overall shape of the function. And here is how it works. First, we look and see what is the degree of the function. That is, what is the exponent of the even term, or of the leading term. If that exponent is even, then we know that 
the shape is going to be kind of like x squared. That is, it's either going to open up and up if the leading coefficient is positive, or it's going to open down and down if the leading coefficient is negative. If the exponent is odd, that is, if the leading term has an odd exponent, then it's going to look kind of like x cubed. That is, it's going to start low and end high if it has a positive coefficient, and it's going to start high and end low if it has a negative coefficient. So if we wanted to graph these polynomials, we can use the transformations that we've learned already. In this case, notice that there are several transformations happening. We have a reflection across the x-axis. We also have a shift to the left by 5 and a shift up by 3. And so this function is going to look like the x to the fourth function, except it's going to be moved over to the left, up 3, and then flipped so it opens down. This next function, g of x is equal to 3 times x minus 3 to the fifth minus 2, has three transformations as well. First, it's being stretched by a factor of 3, so it's going to be a little skinnier than it would be otherwise. Here it's being shifted 3 to the right and down 2. So the function here would look like this. It still has the basic shape of the x to the fifth function, but it's been shifted and stretched. We can also graph this function by just looking at transformations. If we started with our base function, x cubed, it would look something like this. The first transformation that we would need to do is to reflect this across the x-axis because it's negative, and so it would look like this. Then we need to stretch this by a factor of 4, which is going to make it skinnier. And finally, we have to shift the graph up by 5, a vertical shift. This would be the graph of negative 4x cubed plus 5. Unfortunately, we cannot use transformations to graph all polynomials. In this case, f of x is equal to x cubed plus 2x squared minus 5x minus 6. There's no way to factor this so that it looks like f of x is equal to some number times x minus h to the third plus some number. It simply does not factor that way. And so we must rely on other methods in order to graph this polynomial. If a polynomial cannot be put into a form that we can graph it by transformations, it's beneficial to put it in what we call factored form. Here is an example where we take f of x is equal to x squared minus x minus 12 and rewrite it as x, f of x is equal to x minus 4, x plus 3. This is what we call factored form. If you were to foil these out, you would realize that it is exactly x squared minus x minus 12. The benefit in having the function written in this form is that we can easily tell what the x-intercepts are. If you remember, if we have a function and we want to find where the x-intercepts are, we have to set that function equal to 0 and solve. In this case, setting x squared minus x minus 12 is equal to 0 and solving, well, the easiest way to do that would be to factor it into x minus 4x plus 3, and it would be clear that the answer, or that is the zeros, are x equals 4 and x equals to negative 3. If the function is already in factored form, then all the work has been done for us, and it's very easy to find what those x-intercepts are. In this example, we have the cubic function f of x is equal to x cubed plus 2x squared minus 5x minus 6. I've rewritten the function in factored form so that we can easily find the zeros or x-intercepts for this function. Here is a graph of the function. As you can see, the zeros or the x-intercepts of this function, that is where it crosses the x-axis, are at negative 3 negative 1, and positive 2. We can find those very easily by looking at the factored form and setting each of those factors separately equal to 0. It's very difficult to find these um, zeros by just looking at 
the function written in the expanded form. So when you factor a polynomial, there may be as many factors as the exponent of the leading term. What this means is, if you have a degree n polynomial, there will only be at most n zeros. This fact also makes sense when you think about the turning points. If you have a degree 3 polynomial, it will have at most two turning points. And if you try to draw a, a shape that only turns around twice, there's only a possibility of it passing the x-axis in three points. So let's look at how we would graph a polynomial function if we're given that function in factored form. The steps are simple. First, we want to plot the x-intercepts. If we have the polynomial in factored form, then it's easy to find those intersects, intercepts. In this case, we would have x is equal to negative 1, x is equal to 1, and x is equal to 4. We can plot those x-intercepts like so. Next, we can plot the y-intercept. If we're given the function in expanded form, the y-intercept is always just the constant term. In this case, that would be 4. And we can plot that point. The next thing that we want to do is plot the end behavior. Since this is a degree 3 polynomial and the coefficient is positive, that is, it's a positive x cubed, then we know that it's going to start low and end high. So we can plot that end behavior like so. Finally, we can simply connect the rest of the dots. And so we can, we can take the graph from negative 1 up to 4, and then back down, and then around. And this is the graph of this polynomial. Here is another example. Try to graph this polynomial using the methods that we saw before. Pause the video so that you have time to do this, and I'll wait a few seconds before showing you the graph. In this case, the graph of this polynomial looks like this. Now, there are some interesting things happening here that we are going to discuss in just a moment, but you should have been able to get the zeros of this polynomial. First, since x is a factor, not x minus something or x plus something, but just x, it means that 0 is an x-intercept. That is, the graph crosses through the origin. We also had x-intercepts at 2 and negative 1. Something peculiar about this particular function is that the x plus 1 in factored form happened twice. Sometimes we'll see that written as x plus 1 squared. We're going to talk more about this in a moment. The multiplicity of a factor tells us what happens at that x-intercept. That is, if you have an x-intercept, there's two things that could possibly happen. First, the graph could go through the x-axis, much like it did at 0 in the example before, or it could bounce off the x-axis, or it could touch the x-axis, much like it did at x is equal to negative 1 in the previous example. This behavior can be determined by looking at what we call the multiplicity of that factor. The multiplicity of a factor is how many times the factor is repeated. And sometimes we can call this as a repeated root. In the last example, here we have the zeros and their multiplicities. Notice that the zero x equals negative 1 had a multiplicity of 2. Now, since that multiplicity was even, then we know the function is going to bounce at that point, or it's going to touch the x-axis but not go through. 
At the other two zeros, since they were odd, we know that the function is going to go through the x-axis axis at those points. Let's suppose we had this polynomial function. It's very long and complicated, but knowing what we know, we can talk, or we could actually sketch a graph of this. First of all, we can determine the end behavior by looking at the leading coefficient, or the leading term. In this case, we don't have the polynomial in expanded form, but that's okay. You can actually find the leading term by looking at, or multiplying, the x values on each of the factors. In this case, we have x squared times x times x cubed times x. Since there are seven of those, including the exponents, we know that if we were to expand it, the leading term would be x to the seventh. And so the end behavior would be that it opens, or it starts low and ends high. We can also find the y-intercept when you have a polynomial in factored form. In order to do this, you have to multiply all the constant terms. Also take into consideration their powers. In this case, we have negative 2 squared times 3 times negative 1 cubed times 4 is negative 48. So that's where this graph is going to cross the y-axis. Now, here we have four distinct zeros. The first zero is at 2, and it has a multiplicity of 2 because it's being squared. We have a, at 3, we have a multiplicity of 1. At 1, we have a multiplicity of 3. And at negative 4, we have multiplicity of 1. In this case, looking at whether these multiplicities are even or odd will tell us whether the graph is going to bounce at those points or go through the x-axis. Try to graph this on your own. I'll switch to the next side, slide in just a moment. Here is a sketch of the polynomial that we looked at before. Notice that since the multiplicity is even, it bounces at 2. And since the multiplicity on all the other zeros are odd, then it goes through the x-axis at all of those points. This is just a sketch of this graph. It's actually not completely accurate. If you were to graph this completely, it would look like something down here in, in the right-hand corner. Notice that between the, the negative 3 and negative 4, it's extremely steep. In this case, the function doesn't turn around around 10. That is, the turning point there is not at 10. It's actually way, way higher um, than that. However, this would be a rough sketch of the function. That is, it's an indication of what this function looks like without having all the details. In this class, we're not going to worry about how far up or down the graph goes. There are techniques that we can develop in calculus to determine exactly where those turning points occur. So for this class, as long as the graph is correct on the side of the x-axis, that is, whether it's positive or negative is correct, it'll be okay. So when graphing polynomials in this class, make sure that everything we've learned how to find is accurate, and then just approximate the rest. So in summary, what we've learned how to do is to draw a rough sketch of a polynomial if we're given that polynomial in factored form. What we've really done is learned some ways of analyzing polynomials when they're given to us in a certain way. We've learned about the leading term and what it tells us about the polynomial, that is, it tells us the end behavior. We've learned about the constant term and how it tells us what the y-intercept is going to be. And we've found that if the polynomial is in factored form, then it's really actually quite easy to figure out what the zeros are. And with the multiplicity, we can tell exactly what happens at those zeros. 
So if we have the polynomial in factored form, we can draw a rough sketch of that. What we're going to learn soon is how to take a polynomial that is in expanded form and write it in factored form so that we can do this analysis. I hope this video helps you better understand how to graph polynomial functions. Thanks for watching.